Greg and Josh are not paid critics. They are not experts, nor do they claim to be. They are just two nerds that love to talk about internet shows. However, they're still going to tell you about what they think. So sit down, relax, and enjoy the latest episode of All Queued Up. All right, in five, four, three, two, one. Gigantic Jonads. <laughs> hey guys, welcome to another episode of All Queued Up. Josh decides to always throw a fucking loop at me, a screwball, a curveball, whatever you want to call it, every time we go to record, and that one got me good. Guys, I'm Greg <laughs> Deeds, your host. With me always is Josh Fisher. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing much better now. <laughs> oh, oh <laughs> fuck! Anyway, you, you lost it. That's great. I oh, love that it. Was good. No, that one got me. Um, guys, if you're new to the podcast, uh, what Josh and I do here is we watch two shows in their entirety on an internet streaming platform: Netflix, Amazon never Hulu at this point, but Hulu maybe some point. YouTube Premium, if uh, if it's a Karate Kid sort of thing. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, we watch both shows in their entirety. We give thoughts and impressions and then a grade at the end. Um, we do sometimes kind of talk about spoilers. So fair warning to that. Uh, we try not, we try not to talk too heavy on the spoiler, but we do, we do have to discuss some plot details. So, um, if, if well, we generally uh, give you a spoiler warning if we have to true. discuss a spoiler. But I was also going to say, like, I've met a lot of people who their idea of a spoiler is if someone goes, man, I really, really enjoyed it. Like, that's a spoiler to them. So if that's the case, maybe not the podcast for you. But uh, no, absolutely not. Because, you know, that's what we do. Yes, that is what we do. But uh, that's a fair warning. Um, sometimes also the shows that we talk about do have heavy themes. Uh, Jack Ryan will be one of them. Um, so if there's certain topics that does you know just don't really work well with you, yes, if you're a warning as well, guys. Today we're going to talk about Jack Ryan season two. You can find that on Amazon Prime and uh, season three of the Toys That Made Us, which I'm very excited to talk about. But before we get to those two shows. Uh, Disney Plus has been around for approximately three weeks now. Almost four. No, three. Two. Two weeks? Is it two weeks? Two yeah, weeks it is two the, weeks. Two weeks from today as of this recording. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, damn. I was thinking three episodes of Mandalorian, so three weeks, but yeah, two weeks. Uh, but that's what we're going to be talking about first. We're going to talk about the third episode of The Mandalorian. Um... And we're going to be doing this every episode, so if you want to hear our thoughts and impressions on each episode, come back next week. We'll talk about episode four and five and so on down the line. Um, and uh, without further ado, let's kind of just dive into episode three of The Mandalorian. Well, as you know, episode two left off with him getting his ship repaired after having to deal with the Mudhorn. And the Mudhorn about killing him, and the Baby Yoda using the Force to immobilize the Mudhorn, and he stabbed it with his fast-acting poison-tipped dagger uh, and killed it almost immediately. Uh, then he repaired his ship after he took him that egg and, you know, made his way off planet. And then we see him come back in system to claim his bounty prize. And he takes the uh, Baby Yoda to the gentleman who employed him, this Imperial figure who we have not been given a name yet, and the Dr. Pershing character. They scan the Yoda and take it away, and he says, what are you going to do with him? 
And he was like, uh, that's, that's uncharacteristic of, <laughs> it's uncharacteristic of one of your kind. You're not supposed to ask. We don't tell. Take your bounty and leave. He goes, gets his bounty, which is a very hefty case of multiple, multiple pieces of Beskar steel. And he takes it back to his covert, his tribe. And his tribe, as he unveils the Beskar to the Forge, who is basically the clan clan mother, um, she says, "This can make a whole a whole suit of armor." And he's and she's like, "It can also make your signet." What did you kill? The Mudhorn. She's like, "That'll be your signet." He says wasn't a clean kill. I was helped by an enemy. And she's like, why didn't the enemy help you? It's like, it didn't know it was my enemy at the time. And so she's like, he's like, give some to the families. The families are the future. And they have this saying, this new saying that has come up in the Mandalorian, in the tribe itself. This is the way. Yeah, last and, last week it was uh, I have spoken, and this week it's uh, this is the way. Well, I have spoken was in both of the first two. Eh, yeah, <coughs> I mean it didn't become yeah. a meme until after the second episode, but yes, that's yeah, more so what I'm yeah. talking about. I was like, I've seen a but, lot of like memes of uh, this is the way. Yeah, that was like instantaneous. Like that morning when I watched it, I was like, this is the way. <laughs> yeah. And dude, it's becoming a thing. Um, but yeah, so he gets his armor after he and, uh, like this heavy infantry Mandalorian, who's just a big hulking dude, calls him a coward and tries to wrest his helmet from his head and they go at it. And she's just watching this go on. She finally is like, all right, enough. He can't be a coward because when you accept this lifestyle, you become both prey and hunted or you're both prey and the hunter. A coward does not accept that. Or is, does not adapt that lifestyle. This is the way. And the whole clan's like, this is the way. So she makes his armor. You see more flashbacks of him uh, as a kid and his parents trying to get him to safety. And I guess dying during the purge. Uh, because you see a super battle droid getting ready to fire on him. And that's when he snaps back out of his flashback. And then it cuts to the cantina where he goes to meet Carl Weathers' character, Grief Karga. Uh... And he's like, I want my next job. He's like, oh, come on, let's hit the town. Let's go celebrate. He's like, I want my next job. He's like, all right, here you go. Pick the litter. And he chooses a bounty. He's getting ready to leave, and he's like, what are they going to do with it? And uh, Grief Cargo was like, don't ask questions. It doesn't matter. Forget about it. Get you some spice. It'll be done by the time you jump to hyperdrive. It'll be all forgotten. Don't worry about it. So he goes back to his ship. He's getting ready to take off. Reaches, He fires up his engines, reaches for this one lever, I guess, to engage thrust and lift off. And he notices the knob is not on it because the baby Yoda was playing with it. And he kept saying, it's not a toy and taking it from him. He powers down his ship and he goes and just basically rescues the baby Yoda. Um, in a very uh, John Wick sort of way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he just he blow he creates a distraction in the front, goes to the back, blows a hole in the back of the building, goes through, and he killed sixteen stormtroopers on his way through that, from start to finish, very easily, mind you. <laughs> yeah, the one when he was surrounded after he got the baby, and the doctor's like, "Look, I was trying to protect it." He would have been dead now if it wasn't for me. And then the doctor looks up. And the doctor, he is, uh, he has the uniform of a Camino cloner on, by the way. Um, oh, didn't know that. A lot of people, yeah, a lot of people noticed that in the first episode and they suspected, oh, Baby Yoda's a clone. No. Baby Yoda's not a clone. I think he is an actual, naturally born member of the species. And I think that they want to clone him. They want him, and you know, dead or alive, it doesn't matter. The doctor says alive, definitely alive. Why? Because it's easier to extract living tissue and clone from living tissue and have that on hand 
than it is from only getting maybe one, two good samples from dead tissue, you know? So it makes sense that he has to be alive. That's just my theory. Anyway, anyway, uh, you know, using the little whistling bird wrist rockets, you know, he had, he employed four of them to kill those stormtroopers. It looks like he's got eight left because there were 12 slots. I counted on his wrist, on his wrist mount. Um, he gets the kid out and he's on his way to his ship. And as soon as he leaves the building with the baby Yoda, every bounty hunter in the, in the town, their tracking fobs start, uh, going off. So he's on his way back to the outskirts of the town where his ship's parked and he's getting ready to take off and all the bounty hunters close in on him, the whole guild that's there. And Grieve Cargo's like, put the kid down, let's talk. He's like, how can I trust you? He's like, I'm your only help of you getting out of here alive. So he goes over to a speeder, sets the kid down, and then immediately fires off a shot at one of the bounty hunters and jumps over into the back of the speeder next to the kid. Tells the droid to drive, and it's so fucking Wild West like cowboy on a fucking stagecoach, you know, firing from the back of it at, you know, a bunch of outlaws. And uh, they take the speeder out, and he's sitting there, and he's taking out three or four. Then he starts uh, getting his disintegration rifle out, and he disintegrates like three more. And then they start to close in on him, and they're firing at him, and they've got him pinned down, and he thinks, well, shit, this is it. And he's looking at the kid. The kid looks at him. And then you see the whole goddamned fucking clan of Mandalorians swooping in with fucking jetpacks and just whipping ass. And I tell you, that is one of the coolest fucking things I have ever seen on the screen before. (laughs) That was amazing. And then the heavy gunner there, he's like, get the, get him out of here. Get to safety. He's like, you're going to have to relocate the whole covert now. He's like, this is the way. And then the Mandalorian says back to him, this is the way. And then he gets in his ship, and Grief Carter is trying to get the jump on him one last time. He shoots him and takes off. Grief Carter comes to, and it's like classic Western. You know, he had two pieces of Beskar inside of his tunic, pulls them out, and they had saved his life. And the Mandalorian's flying out, and, you know, he's in the atmosphere. He's getting ready to uh, ascend so he can go to space and then hyperspace. And the heavy enter guy, he's got the jetpack, and he flies up alongside him. They look at each other, and he salutes him. And the Mandalorian says to himself, I got to get one of those, talking about a jetpack. And then he's going to hit the hyperdrive, and he grabs the ball uh, and just drops it into the Baby Yoda's hand, and that was how it ended. And I'm like, oh my god, that's so awesome. (laughs) Dude, dude, this show, holy fuck. If you can't tell, I loved this episode. This episode's been my favorite so far. Well, it's really funny that you say that, like, the, the scene where all the Mandalorians show up and help as one of the greatest things you've ever seen on TV, because... I did not have that visceral reaction. Like, don't get me wrong. It was fucking rad. It's just... Like, you gotta do way more than that to really fucking make me... Like, my jaw hit the floor. Um, No, no. You're you're misinterpreting what I say. It's not one of the coolest things I've ever seen on TV. That's the coolest thing I've ever seen. I'm sorry. That was just badass. The whole Mandalorians come together in a, in in a lore that's been established where only one of us can come and go at a time. We can't have multiple ones of us above ground, you know. And it's just like they are the clan. They each represent the clan, and then one's one's in some serious shit. The whole clan comes to his side to take on this bounty hunter guild. Not only is he in shit, now the whole clan's gonna be in shit. That, for a Star Wars moment, that was awesome. The only thing I can say in the Star Wars universe that tops that for me is the Rogue One Darth Vader sequence. I'm telling you, that's how much I loved that. And I think it's the clan, the, the, you know, the clan coming together to band together like that. That was just amazing for me. I love Star Wars to death. I really fucking do. Like, to the extent that I have it permanently (laughs) put on my body. Um... 
But there is only one moment in Star Wars that legitimately put my jaw on the floor. I have seen every single film multiple times, had the first time moment situation, have played plenty of video games, and the the only time that I legitimately had my jaw on the fucking floor was uh hyperspace into a bunch of ships. Um that fucking floored me. As for, I mean, this is really the first time I've watched a Star Wars TV show that I was, like, this deeply invested, so I'll give them that. Oh, I yeah. fucking love this show. Like, it's it's really enthralling and, and deeply entertaining the entire time it's on. Um, It's totally the, it's the most Western that Star Wars has ever been, in my opinion. Uh, oh, yeah, without a doubt. Um. I just don't know, man. Like you say, like you're like it's the coolest thing I've ever seen on TV, and I'm just like I disagree. Like I I don't know, man. Like I I don't. I guess I don't feel the same way you do about that scene by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, I mean, right now, like for me, <laughs> some of the coolest shit I've ever seen on TV or in a TV show is coming from Watchmen. Well, I mean that's good too, but this is better to me. I dis I wholeheartedly disagree. I mean, like, like if for I was entertainment, to, if, now, I'm not saying it's done better overall as a show. I'm saying for my entertainment value, yeah, oh, no, yeah I got this, you. Hands down, I got you. you. You're enjoying Mandalorian more than you are Watchmen, and, and I feel I'm enjoying that, I feel both. I, I'm enjoying both immensely. Right? No, no. This but, is this is literally comparing like apples to apples. The Mandalorian it's, and the Watchmen. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 something that's fucking like a plus entertainment to a plus entertainment. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just two after, different types. After I watch Mandalorian, I'm like, okay, cool. I can wait till next week. Watchmen, I fucking think about that shit all goddamn week. I haven't stopped talking about what Sunday's episode of Watchmen. Really, dude? Hmm. Oh my god, they're so. I mean, it was it was really good. Don't get me wrong. Layer after layer, it's a fucking onion. Every fucking time I turn around and think about it, I'm like, here's a new layer to what happened, and oh fuck, dude, so good, so good. It was good, but it it was it was good. But I've been I watched The Mandalorian three times before Madison went to school Friday morning. Talked about it all weekend. I mean, I watched The Watchmen last night. It is good, don't get me wrong, but I'm still hopped as hell about that episode of The Mandalorian and super excited about the new episode Friday. Um, I hate waiting. I hate waiting week to week. I like to watch it on my own terms. It's like, okay, you got all eight episodes today. I can choose to watch two today or four today or even all eight today if I want to, whatever so, I feel like. So that's actually I don't like something, this week to week shit. That's something interesting to me about Right now, the two biggest shows to me that are week to week that I like can't fucking wait for is Mandalorian and Watchmen. The yeah. moment that I have the opportunity, I'll watch them straight up. Oh, um, yeah. Yesterday, being, I had a lot of shit I had to do, and that's why I didn't get to watch it until last night, sadly. Right. Um, well, that's why I say the moment that I get to. Um, because like with Watchmen, I have to like, like it airs while I'm still out working because it's East Coast time or whatever. Anyway. Um, yeah. but, uh, when it comes, when, when I'm talking about like, how do I, how do I put this correctly? Like both shows have me by the balls straight up. But I think the reason that Watchmen has propelled itself in terms of quality for me or not quality, but the, the, the entertainment value is Mandalorian is is very straightforward. There's not a whole lot of layers to it. Like you can speculate all you want, but there's not a whole lot there to constantly like like today I was fucking talking about Watchmen and I found another layer. I, I I'm not yeah, even kidding. But, like but, but I'm the not Mandalorian doing that with Mandalorian. Doesn't, it doesn't need that though, because it's that damn good without having to have that. But I also think that Mandalorian is structured in such a way that it doesn't need to be episodic. That it could absolutely 100% be one lump sum. No, it could have been easily. But I feel like Watchmen benefits from having a week to think about it. Eh. 
I don't like waiting, period. Give it all to me then. See, so I think, I think, I honestly feel like Watchmen, if you, if you were able to jump into episode, to the next episode after like this Sunday or last Sunday's, I feel like there's a lot of information or layers that you would miss out on. Um, For me, and, and this is just coming from the idea of like the comic book, you know, the first time I ever read the Watchmen was this big ass fucking, uh, um, omnibus book sort of thing so i was able to absorb all of it immediately and there was so many little things i missed because i wasn't able to absorb what i had just read week or month to month um and i feel like watchmen the show benefits from that same thing whereas mandalorian it wouldn't matter you could watch mandalorian in uh, with every episode right in front of you in one fucking binge watch session and be totally fine. I mean, I could do both with both, you know, I mean, you say that, but I do, I do say that because I'm not playing video games or doing anything else when I'm watching things. Well, to be clear, to- <laughs> I'm just fucking with you. I know. I was also going to say, I know that, you uh, actually stop and I pay should- attention to it. <laughs> yes. I don't play things that couldn't be paused is my point. But um uh the other thing I was gonna say is that uh I, I'm not saying that you couldn't do that with Watchmen, I'm saying it benefits from it. Um which is an entirely different thing. Uh I'm 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 pissed that they still haven't resolved the cliffhanger from last week still. I'm pissed off about that. See that's actually one thing I really, really like about Watchmen is that Mm-mm. every single episode is not a direct continuation of the last episode. Nope. And that a lot of what you're experiencing is... Happening in real time while things happen in the prior episode. Kind of kind of happening in real time. Like, it's, yeah. it's very strange yeah. how it's structured. It's not structured... Like, that's, the th- that's what's funny. I'd say that's the difference between the comic book and this, is that the comic book is structured in a very linear manner. There's a mm-hmm. reason that each page has nine panels. Exactly. Unless it's like a bigger picture. Um, yeah. But the show goes, no, we're going to like, we have to structure this like a TV show. We can't structure it like a comic. Whereas Mandalorian is structured like a fucking comic book. Mandalorian is structured like a video, video game. Like 100%. And there's nothing well, wrong with that. So, this is, not, this so is less far. of a critique and more, more of a note. Like I've noticed it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so far it's progression. Point A, point B, point C. It's it's really unfair to compare Mandalorian with Watchmen because they're so unbelievably different shows. Oh, they're completely different, and I love them both. But I love them both for completely different reasons as well. Sure. I yeah. I think I think that the what we're what you and I are getting at is that what the entertainment level we're getting out of both shows. There's a, there's a, I'm enjoying Watchmen more than Mandalorian, but by the smallest fucking margin, and the same goes for you, but the opposite direction. We, we, I'll, you can say that. That doesn't make it true. I don't know. Uh, we're six, we're six episodes in the, into the Watchmen, and they've all been great. Uh, it didn't really start picking up though until the third episode. But see, know. that's I I disagree with that because like after episode one, I was like, oh no, I was hooked after episode one, but I think it just got a little more intensified after episode three or during episode three. I think that the plot definitely took a a strong charge after episode three. I'll give you that, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. um, for me, like. There was so many mysteries that still needed to be figured out at the end of episode one that I was just, I was there like wholeheartedly. Like something that others did not pick up on, that I've picked up on, is that when something bad is about to happen to a character, at some point prior to their that bad thing happening, you can hear a TikTok. In the not background. necessarily, though. Why? Why do you say it's, that? It's, 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 well, we haven't seen if. That one, because that one incident where it happened at the end of episode five hasn't been resolved yet, so we don't I, hold know on. if something I didn't say, bad happened. I didn't say dead. 
I said bad. No, you said something bad, and I said we don't know if something bad happened, though. So think about what happened to him in that episode after the TikTok. Something bad happened to him. We don't know what happened to him. Yes, we do. No, we don't. Josh, we watched... We watched him discover something that completely changed his entire goddamn outlook. That was the bad thing. That doesn't mean it's a bad thing. I mean, I wouldn't say it's a good thing. Well, people are hesitant to accept change. They're yeah. boomers. I fucking Christ. God, God damn it, Josh. Okay, boomer. You're the worst type of person. You know that? I really am. I don't know why anyway, people like me at all. We've been on these two shows for 25 minutes. We should probably and talk we about We weren't even two. planning on talking about fucking Watchmen at I all. I can't stop talking about it. <laughs> I know, and that's your problem. constantly on my fucking mind, like, all day. I love that goddamn show. Anyway, With every episode three. Soul. <sighs> Greg likes the Watchmen. We both like it, but he's fucking orgasming over it. So As for episode three of The Mandalorian, I give it an A fucking plus because it was awesome. Oh, I do too. I do too. It's it, that's what's so weird is that I don't think either of us would give like it, like episode six of Watchmen or episode three of Mandalorian any less than a fucking A plus because they're both stellar fucking shows. But oh, incredible! Yes, but, but it's we're like <laughs> we're we're literally arguing like not even arguing. We're just discussing like I don't know, man, like. It's so weird. It's so fucking strange. But like every Friday, I want to, I want to, I want to hear the tears fall from the butt hurt fanboys that are angry about this specific character in episode six actually getting context and history oh, added to their character. Oh, Here, well, here's here's the thing. If you want, if you want to go into butt hurt territory, uh, apparently a bunch of Star Wars fans are butt hurt over the fucking ten second clip of Rise of the Skywalker. Where uh, the fucking stormtroopers are on the back of those motorized bike-looking things and get launched off. And then C-3PO's like, they can fly? And Finn goes, they can fly! And Poe turns towards the, like, towards the back, towards the driving, the, whatever he's driving, and goes, they can fly! Like, it's a funny beat. It's great. And, and I've, not, I've not seen it. It's um, a very short clip. It's a very well, short... It shows nothing. But regardless... What fanboys are butt hurt about is the is like the fucking vehicles that the stormtroopers are driving. Okay, <laughs> it's so stupid. I'm like, you guys know that vehicles in Star Wars have had wheels and treads before, right? Like it's a thing. Like just because they're not hover bikes doesn't mean anything. It's oh, it's so funny. Um, but that's what I was getting at. Is like I'm not surprised that people are butthurt over the revelation in episode six of Watchmen. I'm also not surprised that fanboys are butthurt over, like, legitimately calling Baby Yoda Baby Yoda. Oh, I know. Let's just fucking call him Kevin from now on because you know he doesn't have a species that's been named. That's so. Funny. It's just like it's Kevin. It's Baby Kevin now. Are you happy? Are you happy, Karen, that we named it Kevin? Karen? Oh, that's so funny. But, so, um, we spent way too much time on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I was going to move on, but we got on to butthurt fanboys. Anyway, so, uh, let's dive into Jack Ryan first, because I think we're going to have more to talk about with, uh, unless you want to start with Toys That Made Us. Uh, go ahead. We can talk Jack Ryan. It's fine. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, Jack, Jack Ryan Season 2. Picks up quite some time after season one. Uh, if you yeah. have a, if you have a synopsis, Josh, you can. Oh uh, well, I didn't have one already pulled up yet, but uh, season <laughs> two. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate it. No uh, season <laughs> season two starts basically uh, with Jack Ryan. He is working. Um, uh, with the State Department, he is assisting a senator, which is one of his best friends. Turns out they served in the uh, Marines together. And the senator was actually responsible for saving Jack's life. And they were really close. And they are on to 
Uh, well, they're looking into government corruption in Venezuela. Now, at the end of season one, uh, James Greer got restationed. He was given Moscow, which is basically the desk that every CIA agent wants because it's the best post in the world, they say. Uh, he is investigating a satellite that was launched from the South China Sea and the <clears throat> the ship that it launched from, they tracked it to a port in Venezuela. So they're both, both working two different angles and meet up in Venezuela to where they start unraveling and getting into some shit. And it was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was, it was a lot more fast paced than the last season. It absolutely was. Uh, breakneck speed on this one. Uh, it also had like an interesting way to tell the story where season one was kind of all about Jack Ryan and it didn't really dive too much into other characters. Like it did a little bit, but not too much. But this season was like. Hey, we're going to show you this random ass character that cleans boats and he used to be in the military and there's something along the lines with him and it'll fucking come back around at some point. I was just like, that's yep. strange. That's Dude. All right. The, the, um, when he was actually recruited, Marcus Bishop was his name. When he was, when he was recruited, the guy that recruited him, um, God, what was his name? Uh, Matisse. Oh, yeah. That guy. I mean, he was visiting with his grandma. And he was like, what are you doing here? She's like, oh, Mr. Spicoli was just talking to me about such and such. He's like, Spicoli? He's like, yeah, Jeff. You know, totally fucking using fucking Sean Penn's character from Fast Times at Ridgemont High using his name. Yeah. I thought that was funny. Dude, I loved the Matisse character. And for the longest time, cuz I've read some of the Jack Ryan books. I and are. I've seen I've seen all of the movies. The only and one I, I thought, haven't seen is uh, Shadow Recruit. That's the only one I haven't seen. The latest one with Chris Pine. Yeah. I thought Matisse was supposed to be John Clark. You know what's funny is, is speaking of John Clark, I was, because uh, I was talking to my dad about this show today while we were door dashing, and um, I looked up Jack Ryan because I wanted to know how many books there were, and I was kind of reading off all the all the books that were written, and, and the fact that after 2013, when Tom Clancy passed away, uh, these two other writers basically took over the entire franchise and wrote a shit ton of more books yeah. on Jack Ryan. Um, but then it was like, as I go down the list, it was like, oh, there's also like a slightly minor character that's in the Jack Ryan books named John Clark. And so I asked my dad. Slightly if, minor. Well, that's what it said. And then I, I, I was like, well, who, I've never heard of John Clark. I've never heard of John Clark. If I have, it just, it was not, it was not something that really stuck out in my brain. So I was, I was looking up a list of like all the John Clark books and I was like, God damn, why don't they make John Clark movies? You, they, they. Rainbow Up Six, he's the guy that those games are centered around. The Tom Clancy Rainbow Up Six book or games. Well, they're not called Rainbow Up Six; they're just called Rainbow Six. But yes. Oh, Rainbow Six. My bad. I so I was like, I was like Rainbow Up. Like, are you talking about Rainbow Six? Yeah. Okay. Well. Yeah. Yeah. I and, and those games, which I have, I admit, I haven't played a ton of them in that fashion. Um. I've still never, I've never heard the name. Or if I, again, if I have, it's not something that's like super sticks out in my mind. Yeah, man. So, uh, let's see. Liv Schreiber played him in the Ben Affleck one, uh, the Sum of All Fears. Willem Dafoe played him in the Harrison Ford ones. Um, yeah. So, I thought that's who this was supposed to be. So I was very surprised to see what happened. Um, mm. Yeah, yeah, I, I can see why. I can see why, because if you're expecting that to be who that is, then the event that happened... Why, why are we pussyfooting around? We're dancing around it. Matisse got killed, and it fucking sucked. 
He got killed real hard. Yeah, he did. Oh, that 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 bad guy though. I'll say this much: uh, he was a fucking rad villain. He's straight up a rad. Max was a rad villain. Oh, boy, you're he, talking about? Uh, yeah, he was. Boy, did he go out unceremoniously? <laughs> I mean, it wasn't totally unceremoniously, but it wasn't the way that I expected in any way, shape, or form. This show threw me a massive curveball because I was like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> Going with that rap. All right. Done and done, I guess. Well, the real overall villain was the sitting president of Venezuela. Right, right, right. And the dude that played him, um, he is like Spain's Tom Cruise, essentially. <laughs> no, seriously, Jordi Mala or Molia or whatever you say his name. Uh, I l- looked him up, and he's like the equivalent to Tom Cruise over there. So it was a pretty significant casting for them. But he did an awesome job uh, oh, yeah. playing, oh, yeah. playing President Reyes. And there, there's so many things in this show. You've got government corruption. Uh, you've got the guy, the, the president and his general, who happens to be his brother-in-law, both of them grew up in the slums of the city that, you know, the president, the presidential palace is located in. In the slums, that's where they grew up. They married a pair of sisters, you know, and now they're brother-in-laws. Um, you got the the general, you actually feel he cares about the people and he cares about the job that his best friend is doing, which is a bad job. And, you know, Jack thinks that weapons have been smuggled into the country and they go and they find this hidden camp out in the jungle, guarded by mercenaries, and it's mining equipment and they can't figure out why. And it's just, it's fascinating to see them thinking the wrong things, but stumbling onto the right path, so to speak, I guess, after we're, That know. would be, honestly, that would be my, my only gripe with this iteration of John, of Jack Ryan, is that in my mind, and I could be wrong, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but this Jack Ryan is a hell of a lot more lucky than super strategic, like past Jack Ryan's. Uh, and I think we're getting that because it's Jack Ryan in his early stages. That's fair. Whereas past Jack Ryan's that we have seen, he has been in the game for a while, so to speak. Uh, especially the Hunt for Red October, Clear and Present Danger, Patriot Games, especially those he's already been established. Um... But yeah, he he had a hunch that something was in the containers. He thought it was weapons because, hey, it was being guarded by arms traffickers, but it was mining equipment, you know, and uh, it's just uh, Arnold Voslow as the head of the mercenaries. I enjoyed seeing him in there. Yeah, no, that was uh, um, that was a surprise because I wasn't expecting to see him in the show. And when they first had him there. I thought it was such a weird bit moment, and then they had him in again later, like, in the forest, and I was just like, oh, that's fucking rad, so he's just gonna be a big part of the show, and then he was, like, right there at the end, and I was like, oh, yay! (laughs) Yay! I I don't want to talk too much about the show without giving, and give way too many big plot points, I mean... Well, that's half the fun of a Jack Ryan story is, is uh, you know, going through all that political intrigue and getting the, the twists and turns and having a good time with that aspect. So I totally agree with you. Um, but uh, I loved the station chief in Venezuela, Mike November, that they worked with. I really loved his character. One of the, th- one of the things they did to Greer this season is they gave him a a heart condition, they wouldn't specify what it was other than then the prognosis was bad and he was on medication and that makes him a liability instead of a reliable asset. So that came into play in certain scenes. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I thought that was well done. But I really enjoyed the dynamic, you know, uh, between uh, Jack and uh, Greer, you know, because it was really rocky in season one through a lot of it. And they finally grew to respect each other. Now you can actually see them start to like each other and really like you. You're, you're seeing that bond continue and grow stronger. Because yeah. in the books, Greer becomes like vice admiral of the Navy. And well, that was had... the speaking of that. Like I was looking at the uh, when I was looking at the Jack Ryan character on Wikipedia, I was scrolling down. It was like occupation, and the top two were were uh, president and vice president. It was like fucking win. He he becomes president. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I was like, I was like, why don't they make that into a fucking movie? But maybe the show will get to that point. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, who knows? Uh, you know, I, I think honestly, this season was better than the first season. Well, in that regard, why don't we go ahead and give our uh, final thoughts and impressions? If you do, you want to go first? Yeah, yeah, I'll go ahead. I mean, I'm, I, I don't want to give too much away because this is the kind of show you can't really give away too many spoilers because. The, it's kind of part of the story. It's kind of the point of the story. You finding out you know, what happens. It's a lot of fun. I don't think it would ruin the story, but at the same time, yeah, I don't, I'm not comfortable with giving them on something like this. Uh, but it is a lot of fun. It's well done. It's wonderfully well acted. Uh, you know, John Krasinski did an awesome job. Wendell Pierce did an awesome job. Um, the guy played Mike November. He was a hell of a lot of fun. Uh, Michael Kelly, that was his name. Uh, the the people portraying the Venezuelan president, his general, their wives, uh, the lady playing Gloria Binalde, who was running for president, you know, uh, fantastic job in casting and acting. The fucking cinematography was amazing this time. Well, I mean, it was really good in season one, but they really, I think they... They really did a better job this time. I think it looked better. I think the scripts were done better. I think everything about this season was better. It's a solid fucking A for me. Um, yeah, I mirror most of what you say. Uh, there's there's a few moments in the show that I I couldn't I couldn't really get into that much. And it, it had to do with a lot with uh, that side character who become, I can't remember his actual name, but his code name was Uber. Um, uh, was his, just, the character's name was Mar- Marcus Bishop. Marcus Bishop. He, thank you. He was the he was the retired uh, Navy uh, crewman. He wanted to be a, he seal. wanted to be a seal, and he washed out. Right. He was retired building boats, and he came came back in to help them for that off the boats um, mission. I didn't mind the side stuff with him, but I I did feel that it was a bit much, and I was just kind of like, all right, we can we can move on from this guy, and they just didn't. They were just like, no, we're gonna stay here uh, for a hot minute, so just deal with it. And I was like, all right, I, I guess. I think um, he'll be a recurring character next season, possibly yeah, likely. since Matisse is not going to be back, and he was in the first season, and most of this season, and I really love that character and. Well, I think I think my biggest issue with with what they did with him and how they showed it was that it kind of broke the pacing of the show, um, in in, in not in a good way either. Like it was not like oh this is a nice break because it was his stuff was tense most of the time, um, and then towards the end of the season, it just didn't it kind of fizzled a little bit. I was like ah oh, all right whatever, um, but it's it's that's a gripe. That's a that's a tiny nitpick. It's not that big of a deal. It's it really really not, but. Um. Uh, overall, the show is fucking fantastic, and uh, I think I'm gonna give it an A minus. I think A minus is 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 right where I want it to be. It's it's <sighs> really it's fucking me. good, but not quite great. Yeah, like like I think this show, in a sense, benefits from being a show and the idea that they can really go in depth on certain things, whereas the movies can't um gotcha but i also think that that kind of 
in just the tiniest, tiniest, non-important way, hurts the uh, hurts a little bit of the pacing of the political aspect. So, oh, but okay, I see where you're coming from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 nothing to to really. It's not like, oh dear God, this show sucks because it's not. It's, it's it is tiny. No. Again, this is a tiny, tiny grape. Yeah, give it an A minus en- for Christ's sake. <laughs> if you enjoyed season one, you'll you'll absolutely enjoy season two, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I I think season two is better than season one. I don't remember what score I gave season one, but um, I'm not sure either. It's been a while. But yeah. You'll like season two if you like season one. It's it's still really solid, good quality, and fun to watch. So, all right, guys, on to uh, our last topic, our last show. I always said topic. Um, Toys that made us season three. Um, so this season it was about three different toy lines, three different. Uh, well, it was four. Sorry, Why did I say three. So I was like, it's season three. So something I want to bring up. So so, uh, Josh, if you want to let them know the four toy lines that were made but there's something i want to talk about about specific episode about how each season kind of talks about something that i wouldn't have normally cared about but they still make it fast anyway go ahead uh well we got four episodes this go round as well the first one was on teenage mutant ninja turtles uh the second one was on power rangers the third one was my little pony and the last one was on professional wrestling figures so I definitely grew up playing with Turtles toys, with uh, Power Rangers, and wrestling toys. 100%. Like, my brothers and I loved all three of those things. So I played with those toys. Like, I have a fucking small collection of, of Donatello's mm-hmm. action figures. Um, so those three things were very interesting. There's actually something in the Power Rangers one that I didn't know. And that was that Spider-Man essentially brought giant mechs to live action shows like that. Yeah. Um, I was telling my dad the about Japanese, that. And he goes, the Japanese version of Spider-Man specifically that right, Stan Lee right. licensed out to yeah. uh, Toei. Um, well, I was telling my dad about that. And he goes, well, wasn't there like anime with stuff? I was like, of course. Like giant robots and animes. Are were around before. Well, they were shows, super but. robots like Mazinger, but they were just a robot. They weren't mechs that formed into one human esque form. Was like Gundam after rob- that? Gundam was after. Gundam debuted. What about Voltron? Voltron was after. Gundam. What the fuck? The first really? Mobile Suit Gundam debuted in 1979. This is the 40th anniversary of Gundam. Fucking Go Spider Man. Robo Robo Beast Go Line, or King Beast Go Line, debuted in 1982. Spider Man predated both of those by several years. That's fucking nuts. Yeah, yeah. So your your super robots that. like Mazinger and <laughs> others that were just one single entity, they were also not piloted by humans they were their own entities they were sentient it was spider-man the japanese spider-man live action show um he didn't have a lot of villains they wondered how they could make it more interesting so they had him you know his powers were given into him by an injection from an alien from the planet spider and he had a spaceship and these giant monsters would invade Earth, and he would jump into the spaceship, and it would convert into a super robot. Leo Paradon, so, I believe. Yeah, it. Yeah, they called it the the spaceship was called the Marveler, um, but it would convert into the first uh, on screen human piloted robot. I yeah, I didn't I fucking had no idea. Like I was watching that and I was just like, really? Mm-hmm. And uh, so that was cool. But um as for the toys themselves, like I just watching it going, yeah, 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 no, I you know played with those toys. I know all about those toys. And I remember when I was a kid and uh Power Rangers was huge at this particular time. And my brothers and I, we had we had a toy, an action figure for our favorite Power Ranger, or we had like uh, may I think one one vehicle or something like that. I don't remember, but it wasn't it wasn't one of the uh, Zords, but um, 
we always wanted like the big Zord, so that way we could like take it apart and play it. Like we wanted that, but we just couldn't. Mm-hmm. And we went over to my cousin's house, and uh, they had like every Power Rangers toy. They had the the weapons. They had the 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 they had the Megazord that you could take apart. They had every single action figure. Like they had everything, and I was just like, "This is awesome." Um, but anyway, the point is, is that was huge part of my childhood. So I knew about it very well, well enough, um, knew nothing about my little pony, absolutely nothing about my little pony. And my little pony has a very similar, uh, like start as a lot was from the eighties where it mm-hmm. was like, Oh, we got to make a toy to sell toys. And then, Oh, let's make a show that's based off the toy to sell more toys. But the, my little pony cartoon did really poorly. <laughs> Like, it didn't, it didn't really sell. T- from what I understood, like, no, no. I mean, and, and the the line was really limited because they only put out like six ponies a year back then. It wasn't until Friendship is Magic that hit what seven or eight years ago that My Little Pony exploded, and I think it's awesome writer and creator of friendship of of friendship is magic was actually a fan growing up and i was i was really happy they touched upon that because like that was something for me that was interesting back when that cartoon came out was uh we were heading to my friend's house and we were listening to like a local radio station and they were like so here's a weird thing that's happening today. Like there's a new My Little Pony cartoon and there's a bunch of 35 year old guys that are really into it and they're buying all the toys and watching the cartoon. I was just like, why? And they're my friend's bronies. just like, Ooh. well, my friend goes, they're, they're really, they're just, they're just being weird. They're really dumb. And I was like, there's something more to this, man. Like there's got to be something more to this. And he goes, well, I don't, I don't give a shit. And I was just like, I'm really curious. So like, I went and watched like the first three episodes and like the whole time I'm sitting there thinking like, this is not for me in the slightest. Like I'm kind of getting a headache from the bright colors <laughs> and, um, cause it's all very bright pastel colors and whatnot. And, mm-hmm. uh, and it, it, it wasn't until after episode three that I kind of understood in regards to, why so many adult males and females, to be honest with you, like it was kind of across the board, but mm-hmm. um, why it was so popular in that regard. And that's because the animation is so fucking good in it. Like it's, it, it harkens back to a, a time of, of hand-drawn animation where the animators clearly give a shit. Well, it's also a good story. Um, I suppose know. so. But then again, I only watched three episodes. So, Well, see my daughter, you know, she's 12, but when she was five, six, seven, eight, there for about four years between Monster High and My Little Pony, dude, that was her two favorite things in the world. So she watched a lot of My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, and it was a show that I did not have a problem sitting down and watching with her. You know, it was, I would laugh. There was some funny shit in the show. Would I consider myself a brony? Hell no. <laughs> you know, I never bought a My Little Pony for myself, but I bought plenty for her in the castles. And, you know, I would play with her, you know, and you know how you role play with with the, with the your kid. Uh, you don't specifically know, but you know what I'm talking about. Right, right, right. And, well, yeah. You know. It, I have nephews. Would, <laughs> if if it, it would be like, oh, I want to watch My Little Pony and be like, okay. And afterwards, we'd watch something that I enjoyed and trying to get her into it, you know. So, My Little Pony, what it has become is fun, and I can see the appeal. I don't, I still don't understand the brony culture, because you don't see any other traditional girls' properties, even though I think that's dumb, boy properties, girl properties, they're just intellectual well, yeah. properties, and everybody should be able to enjoy them. I don't make fun of bronies. I just don't quite understand it. But then again, I'm also, you know, a grown-ass man who goes to Transformer conventions, and I'm super into Transformers. Um, but, you know, 
to each yeah. their own. If you enjoy it, great. But I'll never make fun of somebody for what they're into, what they enjoy. Right, and that's 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 exactly my that was my that was my takeaway from after watching those three episodes because I just kind of wanted an idea of what the fuck was going on and like why and and I was just kind of like oh that's kind of fun I get it you know it's I I don't I don't care for it personally I'd read rather watch you know something with a little bit more action um because that's just who I am or sci fi ness yeah. um. But like uh, uh, you know, a few of my friends have shown me like screen like oh look at this look at this. like all all the guys who make this show are, are nerds and 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 they have like all these like cool um, cool references to to games and and other cartoons okay. and stuff that we watch and I was like yeah let me check it out and and uh, um so they would sh- they would show me the clip and it's like. The Lutest twins from Bioshock Infinite as ponies walking in the background, and I'm just like, "All right, that's it. That's okay." <laughs> they <laughs> they I, made I was, one. They patterned him to look like uh, David Tennant from as as the Doctor from Doctor Who, right? And right. They, they called him Doctor Who's. Jesus Christ, that that does not. I'm not happy about that. <laughs> it's a dumb. It's, Pun. It's, it's cute. Sure, it's cute. It um, is. <laughs> anyway, point is, is that there was a lot about that the My Little Pony one that I found interesting because I don't, I didn't know jack squat about My Little Pony. Um. Uh, but yeah, this this season like. Something that I you know, I wanted to get My Little Pony out of the way because the the the, the first episode of the season actually had me crying. Um and I think you know what I'm talking about, Josh. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles episode. Yes. Uh it, there was a two parts that it had me actually tearing up and that was when it started getting into like hardcore nostalgia with the turtles and stuff like that when it showed the toys and how they had the cartoon and market of the toys and stuff like that it just really really brought back a lot of memories of my childhood. And that brought, like, because whenever I get, like, super, emo- like, not emotional, but super happy about something or angry or whatever, I tear up. That's why I just got real emotional over stuff and nostalgic. Um, but uh, uh, at the end of the episode, um, and you'll have to see this, like, like, like we're, tell- we're going to kind of spoil it a little bit, but at the same time, like, it, it, there's a lot more emotional and, and, uh, kind of visceral reaction to it. Um, and that's that uh, Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird, uh, is it? They the show got them to meet yeah, back for up. for the first time in... For the first time decade, in years. A uh, couple decades. I mean, they... Right. They... The show talks about why they, they're yeah, falling yeah. out and whatnot. And, you know, East, Kevin Eastman even says, a lot of it is my fault. Almost all of it is my fault. He's like, you know, and that's a bridge I want to repair, but it's going to be difficult to do. Um, I'm wondering if they've met back up since then. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, because this was filmed a while back, but one of the. uh, Last year and this year, uh, earlier this year. I mean, the show has been done and completed since June. They turned the episodes in, the final cuts, in to Netflix in June. So it took five months for them to get yeah. the episodes loaded and in rotation and everything. But yeah, it was... it. Yeah. But man, uh, the Turtles, you know, a lot of people... It, 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 I don't know what is common knowledge to the casual public. But most people think Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles started with the 87, 88 cartoon, which was horrible. I'm <laughs> sorry. It's horrible. It's horrible. I, I, I have argued then. this. I hated I've it I've argued then. this time and time again, Josh, that most <clears throat> 80s cartoons are not good. That oh, people I have agree. nostalgia for them, and that's fine, but... Because a lot of things that people love and hold on to was the things that they were first exposed to and fell in love with as a kid. Right. Look at me. The biggest things that I've always been attached to in my life 
Star Wars, G.I. Joe, Transformers. Love them. All of them I was exposed to by the time I was, you know, eight years old. Uh, and I own some, well, I sold all my G.I. Joe stuff because it's essentially, it's a dead line. It's not coming back. I, I don't care what they say. I don't see it ever coming back. But Transformers is still going and stronger than ever. Uh, Star Wars is still going. And, you know, there's a lot of amazing product being put out there. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles has been going since 1984 in some way, form, or fashion. started as a comic book. And that original comic book was dark and gritty as fuck and definitely not aimed at kids. And you see how it became a kid's property. Yeah. What's... What's so fascinating to me, something that I've always kind of been interested in, is that that cartoon is so far removed from what the fucking comic was that they don't even seem yep. like kind of the same thing. It's just by title, are they the same? So the fact that the movie, like, mm -hmm. takes the best of both <laughs> and made a fucking stellar film. Yeah, the original <laughs> movie. That's still one of my favorite movies to this day. And, you know, I watched it recently. I watched it recently, and it still holds up. Oh, it's fantastic. And, you know, and... It, uh, yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. What's crazy is that the sequel doesn't. The sequel is more like the, the 80s cartoon. No. The sequel is definitely more of a cartoon flair, and I don't care much for both of the Well, sequels. that's that's what's funny is that... I will watch, that, I will watch the first one, the first sequel, The Secret of the Use. It's okay, but Turtles 3... Is terrible. Yeah. Well, say Secret of the Ooze has a uh, special place in my heart because my brothers and I ruined the VHS on that one, watched it so much. But um, as for uh, the, the, I can't remember the title of the third one. Um, because it's not Turtles in Time, it's just. No, Turtles in Time was a video right. game. I'm pretty sure it was just Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3. Is it? I thought I had a subtitle, but uh, the third one's just bad. It's just straight up bad. And um, But I went back and watched Secret of the Ooze, and uh, oh, it's not it's not as bad as the 80s cartoon, but it is a rough watch. But this is also why yeah. I love things. I mean, I can watch it. I can watch it because it's fun. Sure, right. But the first one is just it's awesome. really fucked. Still. It's really fucked. But the uh, point is, is that, it, like, that episode brought back so much nostalgia for me and whatnot, I just couldn't help but tear up. And then the Power Rangers episode, which I watched, like, right the fuck after, it was, like, this nostalgia overload in my brain. And I'm just sitting there blown away that Spider-Man, my favorite superhero since I was a kid, the, the Japanese version of that brought giant mechs to, like, basically to entertainment in Japan. And I was like, what in the fucking hell? And and subsequently, pop culture I, and the rest of the I, world. I, if you had told me that before watching the show, I had no fucking clue. Um, but then the wrestling one was interesting because I knew the wrestling history. That I knew that. Didn't know the stuff about toys. Had no clue about that. So that was interesting to watch how they built the episode around history of wrestling it almost felt like the episode was more about the history of wrestling and not so much the toys, um, which I actually enjoyed because it gave context to what was going on with the toys in a very fun way. Yeah. And here's the thing, and I know this has probably a lot to do with Netflix's desire to keep it 45 minutes, 50 minutes long. Basically what you would see for an hour of broadcast television with commercial breaks. Because um, we interviewed Brian Volkweiss, uh, as we've mentioned before, episode 10 and episode 18. Uh, episode 18, we lost the audio, and it's just a recap. But he actually said one of the most difficult things that there was to do about being a show creator was the editing. Uh, and that was the most painful process because... The original cut for Star Wars they turned in was two and a half hours, and they had to trim it down to 55 yeah. minutes. And he said that was so fucking painful. So uh, that's the thing I noticed in both the Turtles 
and the wrestling episodes, there's a lot of shit they actually didn't right. get to talk about. Like the licensing of Teenage Mutant Ninja, of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. NECA makes some of the most beautiful Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uh, figures there are. I have the movie versions. I don't want the toy versions or the toon versions. But Super 7 is making new modern versions of the original toys and putting them out. NECA is making like cell-shaded cartoon accurate representations of the original 80s and 90s cartoon. I want the Donatello um, of all of those that you just listed. Well, I mean, you know, me, I'm I'm just, I like the movie style, and I like the original comic style. So NECA put out a set of the original comic turtles, complete with their tails and the elongated necks and the thicker lower legs. I'm un, I'm uncertain. Um, I, I don't know about this or not, so that I'm asking you directly. Do they make individual turtles that you can buy, or is it always in those big four packs? No, you can buy them individually. Okay. Uh, like, the GameStop has the movie turtles. You can get the movie accurate 1990 movie accurate Donatello at GameStop for 22 bucks. Um, oh shit. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I have the entire set cause I have the SDCC box set. Um, but yeah, man, uh, they didn't, they didn't touch on that. Like, um, uh, Mondo <clears throat> makes one twelfth scale or one six scale, uh, versions of the turtles, and they're super articulated, but they cost like 160 bucks a piece. But Jesus they, Christ! Yeah, yeah, but they come with so many accessories and things like that. They also come with interchangeable heads, so you can put the original red bandanas on all of them, or their more traditional, uh, different colored bandanas. So it's it's fascinating that he didn't talk about you know, various other properties that are uh, right. companies that make the property. They just focused on Playmates and the cartoons and various comics. Like, they hardly well, I, touched I, on the IDW stuff that's going on. Yeah, I'd love to see, like, a special edition of this show come out where each episode is how long they wanted it to be. I would watch, you know, oh, I'd watch a full two-hour yeah. documentary on each on each thing. But uh, speaking, I'm of, happy with what we're getting. Speaking of, did you notice the change to the original song? The theme song? What do you mean? The, the vocal change to the theme song. It originally of said the, it's of, an eight-part documentary uh, series, and now it says it's... The ongoing series, yes, or the continuing. Yes, I did series. notice that. Uh, yeah, I thought they would just um, redo the I, whole yeah. song, but they just changed that one little bit. <laughs> yeah, you don't, you know, don't broke what ain't, what, don't fix what ain't broken. Um, I assume one thing I did uh, notice, we... and Brian Volquist, I was, he was in an interview on Enter the Realm a couple of weeks ago, available on the Realm of Collectors YouTube channel. Um. He did an interview on there, and he was talking about the biggest uh, part of the budget for the show came in the recreation of, you know, the reenactments of situations. Like in the Transformers episode, like the guy playing Jim Shooter going up to Bob Budiansky and said, you're going to come up with bows for all these, or uh, the, the guys, you know, recreating going on to the set of Star Wars, uh, you know, and seeing things. And those little reenactments, he said a majority of the budget of the show went to those, so this season they did away with them. Did you notice that, or did you just now think of it because I brought it up? I, yeah, I, mean, I, I didn't even think about it prior to you bringing it up, but, like, it wasn't something that I had thought about or thought, like, oh, that's something I would like to know. Like, so I, there you go. I mean, I don't know how to answer that. Yeah, yeah. So, they were able to save on their budget by doing away with those uh, little reenactments. And don't get me wrong, I like the little reenactments, but I didn't find myself missing them because I didn't feel they really added and allowed for more information to be put in. Right, right. Yeah, you gotta... So, 
Better compress as much as you can. I'm hoping they get. <clears throat> I'm hoping they get another, uh, another season. He has some ideas, but this is going to be very finite. There will be a definitive end because he has stated. Uh, he stated on the end of the realm. He said there's three requirements to have a, an episode dedicated to a toy line. It had to have. It has to have a good story. It can't just be oh this line was released. It did well for a while, and that's it. You know. It also has to be a lasting property and still existing today. So something that's been around for at least twenty to thirty or right. more years. So. A lot of properties that people have been clamoring for wanting episodes on is like they just don't meet the criteria because think of the Mount Rushmore of toys. I think you I know you could see. I do. I do think there could be ahead. a special, like a like a movie style special, where he kind of touches on every property that couldn't warrant a full episode. Maybe. It'll be a lot of legwork. I mean, you know, in talking to him, we know how much he has had to travel for this Right, that's why I said could. I didn't say needed to. But. Like flying to Japan multiple times. Right. and Well, because the thing, that, that's the, thing about, it, that's the thing about producing a show here in America is if you have to go to Japan and interview people and you don't get the interview just right or something goes wrong with the audio or anything like that, you either A, have to figure out the budget back in or just say, well, don't know what to do from here on out. Like... As somebody who's been in production of things in the past, like, if anything gets fucked up where you can't go back, like, that's a problem. So, um, yeah, mm -hmm. so I totally get it. But we do have to wrap this up, Josh, because uh, I got to get going here in a second. But uh, why don't yeah. we give our final thoughts? Um, do you want me to go first since I went with – since you went with first on uh, – yeah. yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, go ahead. I mean, it's it's the same as the other two seasons. It's it's highly entertaining. Uh, each episode has information that you might not have known, or if you did know, maybe there's a little piece you didn't know. And regardless, even if you know everything about it, the the way that it's put together is incredibly fun. Um, I cannot recommend the show enough. This season hit a little bit harder for me than the past two because three of the four episodes were my childhood, full on. Um. So there was just there was just a lot more in these in in three of these episodes for me than 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 had been before and and I just I loved them to death. I I uh can't recommend the show enough. Um if you enjoy documentaries, definitely check this out. Um and even if you don't really like you're not really a documentary person but you do enjoy the you know like toy information in general or you want to see because like that's the thing I, I keep expressing about this show to people like my brother i was telling him about it and his reaction was well i don't really i don't really want to watch a show that's going to tell me about how much a uh a um a toy was worth and i responded with well that's not how this works he goes what do you mean i said the show doesn't talk about the worth of a toy it talks about the history of that toy being made hence toys that made us like there's a reason that it's it's a pun, pun what what does what does perceived value of a toy you once had have to do yeah, with i don't know anything? i i i don't know man he just he was like because he wants to buy them and he doesn't have the money to buy them i guess that was his reaction but regardless i told them i said the show is about the history of how it's made so like it goes into the history of Super Sentai, and then it goes into the history of how it turned into Power Rangers, and then how the toys were made, and and that it would you know B Bandai still technically had the the toy made prior to Saban getting it, and they just like brought the fucking thing over to America, and it was just brilliant, like the way that they did that. And I said that to him, and he goes, "Um, well, maybe I'll check it out." And I was like, ah, "Jesus Christ!" All right, well that the show <laughs> the show talks about. Not just the toy. It talks about everything surrounding the toy because I do truly feel like you can't, you really can't get a good foothold on a toy's production until you get to the point of understanding how it got to that point. How? So yeah, there's yeah. just, there's a lot to toy manufacturing that I find fucking fascinating and you will too by watching this because again, it's made. In such a brilliant manner, but uh, this yeah, a plus like I there's no other 
grade I can give this A plus. Definitely check this out if you haven't. You have fucking twelve episodes, now, so yeah, and and they're easy watches, and you don't have to watch them all at once, you know. Um, but I also agree uh, with the grade, and it's just a well done show. I love watching it. I'll, I I love gaining knowledge about anything, and of course, you know, be, me being a uh, avid and active collector of toys and other things. Um, I love hearing all about how things came to pass, um, you know, and it gives you little glimpses of behind the scenes and what could come to pass in the future, potentially. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's just a fascinating, well done show. Really happy that it exists. I'm hoping for another season, um, you know, and it's 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 going to dwindle down maybe they've got two three more potential seasons left in the max um based on the criteria that Brian has set for us but I'm interested and hoping that we get more uh really love it can't recommend it enough yeah. I wholeheartedly agree well uh like I said we got to wrap this one up guys um uh, I'm going to have Josh, uh, real briefly, uh, kind of shout out all the, uh, social links, but normally you'll find them at the bottom of the, uh, play or whatever this is on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, in the, in the show notes, in show the notes description, like, yeah. you'll see, yeah, you'll see links to our Instagram, uh, account, which is all queued up podcast underscore in between each word. Uh, you'll see Twitter, which is at queued up podcast. Um, the Facebook uh, page, the Facebook discussion, uh, all queued up discussions, uh, link to the Redbubble store where you can purchase our merchandise, and uh, as well as our Discord server, where we always have Discord up, and you can contact me and Greg directly, hang out in there. We've got a nice little group going. Uh, we want to grow it, so follow us on all the social media. And uh, if you want to follow me personally, you can check me out on Facebook. I'm under my regular name. All of my social media profiles are linked there publicly. And apart from this show, I can also be found on the Realm of Collectors YouTube channel on two other shows. One is every other Wednesday at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time, an action figure review show called Figga Bangin'. And then every Friday night, live around 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, is a little show called MPSP Theater. And there will be a show tonight. Um, you know, we're going to have a limited cast because it is Thanksgiving uh, week and weekend. So from me and Greg uh, here at All Queued Up, we wish you all a wonderful and happy Thanksgiving holiday. Safe travels if you're traveling. Uh, you know, just spend the time with your loved ones and friends. And, you know, if you don't have anywhere to go, you know, reach out. Say hey. Uh, talk. Whatever. You know, just uh, hit us up. You don't have to spend it alone. Yep. But that's where they can find me. What about uh, you? Greg? You can find me on all social medias at Chub Ruck Geek. Um, you can also follow me on Twitch at Chub Ruck Geek, where I. Try to stream uh, Jackbox Party Packs, party, one of the party packs, from time to time. Uh, it's where Josh and I usually uh, hang out together in a, in a group call with maybe some other friends and whatnot and uh, have a good time. But uh, this Saturday, I was just I was just way too busy all day and just exhausted by the evening, so I just did not feel like it. But um, usually that's not the case. Hopefully this Saturday. We'll, we'll see. But definitely follow it. Follow me on all social medias and Josh to know when we go live with that. Um, and the other thing, I forgot to totally mention what we're watching next week. Or not next week, but in two weeks from now. Next week, next week, Josh oh, yeah. and I will be back with a uh, new episode of Uninhibited. Um, don't know what we're talking about then, but that's part of the show. That's the whole point. Uh, but what we will talk about is Mandalorian Episode 4. Um, so that's a thing. We're always going to be talking about the Mandalorian until it's over. Um, but in two weeks from now... Our next episode, our review episode, will be on Mandalorian Episode 5, 
as I you know stated with the whole Mandalorian thing. Thanks Disney Plus for making this a complicated mess. Um, uh, and then we're gonna be watching, funny enough, uh, season one of movies that made us. So they instead of just keeping this documentary series in focus on toys, they're going to branch out. And I really appreciate that. So I'm very excited about this season. Um, and, and outside of <laughs> the Punisher being a spinoff of Daredevil, uh, of an existing Marvel property, this is the first original property that has spawned a spinoff on Netflix. Oh, okay. Didn't know that. Huh. Just a little fact. That's fun. For, yeah. You know, the three people that were probably interested in me spouting that <laughs> fact going out. Um, and then we're going to watch uh, season three of Marvelous Miss Maisel. You might have caught us while talking about season one and two um, quite a while ago. We were very, very big fans of that season. So we're both excited about season three. Uh, but yeah, we're going to watch those and uh, give our thoughts and impressions in two weeks from now. So join us for that. But guys, that's going to have to wrap this up. I got to get going. I got some Thanksgiving stuff to do. I hope you guys have a good Thanksgiving and we'll see you next time. Take care, everybody.